participants. One of the things you missed out on is this next brief. This, this next brief's been uh, uh, given to our PXO uh, commanders for, uh, we started in 2018 together uh, under uh, uh, then Admiral Miller. Uh, it's been one of the highlights uh, of, of our course and our events. Uh, so I don't know if any of you have seen it. I, I doubt it's likely that any of you have seen it, maybe, maybe a few. Uh, but I think you're going to enjoy it. It'll give you a lot of perspective. Uh, so to introduce this next couple, we got uh, Captain John uh, Inch and Kathy. Uh, goes by Jack, call sign Fingers. He's a 64 uh, Illinois State University grad, uh, AOCS commissioning, and got his wings in January 66 as, uh, as an NFO. It, it goes back a little bit. He's a VF Bubba, uh, F-4 uh, Phantom, so uh, great aircraft. He got two combat deployments, uh, one on the Coral Sea, one on the Ranger. Uh, he did a flag aid job with a, a Navy test, uh, and then he went to VF-161 uh, after his F-4 uh, Phantom Refresher. And if you can read his bio, it's, it's, it's quite an interesting short story in itself. Uh, and he, with VF-161, he got two more combat deployments. Uh, while deployed on the Midway, uh, with two confirmed MiG-17 kills, 285 combat missions under his belt, on 25 August 1972, his luck ran out. He took a uh, he took a surface-to-air missile uh, in his aircraft, and upon landing and being captured, became a POW at the infamous Hanoi Hilton, uh, and that was the saga of Jack and then Kathy at home as a school teacher and a mother. Raising a family, and that's where we'll pick up the story. Uh, I hope you, I hope you dig it. It's, it's a, it's a great story. Jack and Kathy Inch, folks. Thanks, Jay. Uh, first of all, let me say, uh, I'm all thumbs. You can tell we're not professional, right? <laughs> uh, first of all, congratulations on all of you and your current job as commanding officers, greatest job in the world. Um, Kelly uh, mentioned that four cruises, we're, we won't bore you with all four cruises. We're going to talk about the 1972 uh, Midway deployment, which was the most impactful upon us uh, as a family, as a person, and everything. So, we call our uh, presentation uh, One Family's POW Experience because although I was the POW, it affected the whole family. And it's true of uh, everything in, in the Navy, you all know that by now, that uh, everything you do is not just you doing it, it's you and the family, it's incorporated in, in, the, in the whole thing, so it impacts everything. So in 1972, we, uh, we were deployed, we were getting ready to deploy. We are actually out here uh, in, a, in the uh, Pacific uh, doing our workups when all of a sudden uh, they got a call and we stopped operations and steamed back to San Francisco where the, the uh, Midway was important at the time. And the captain on the way said that we've been, we've been uh, ordered to deploy seven weeks early because of the North Vietnamese invasion in South Vietnam and the big Tet Offensive of March 1972. So we got back up to San Francisco, loaded up in airplanes, came back down to San Diego, loaded our gear, went back up and deployed. Uh, after going across the Pacific, and uh, I left uh, Kathy and the girls in, uh, at our nice little boat here in San Diego there you see on the right and we traded that for uh, something that I'm sure you're all familiar with is a state board a state room board carrier which is a little bit different living quarters uh, we got over there and uh, oh let's see we got there about late April I guess or early April and uh, at the time there were two there were two operating stations in, in Vietnam and on the Gulf one was called Dixie Station, the other was called Yankee Station. Very clever. Uh, Dixie Station, when a new carrier came online, they started out in on Dixie Station. We were flying support missions into South Vietnam and to kind of break in the, the new guys and get everybody acquainted with the uh, 
the area again to those that have been there before. And then after a few weeks on Yank or Dixie Station, the carrier would move up to Yankee Station, which was up, up, uh, off the coast of North Vietnam, and when we would start flying missions in to North Vietnam in support of uh, the, uh, the war effort. Um, we got up to Yankee Station in, uh, on 23 May uh, 1972, 50 years ago. Any of you that are still uh, maybe looking for points uh, or credits on a, a uh, Carl H. degree or something like that, this hour you could probably get credit for ancient history, which you're going to hear 50 years ago. Take it up. Um, on 23 May, my pilot and I mugged the gun, God rest his soul. We were, uh, had the lead on a mid cap mission. A mid cap mission, I won't explain to the guys here, but the ladies, a mid cap mission is where you put yourself between where the MIG threat is coming and where the strike is going in so that you protect that, those that are carrying a bomb so they can get in there and not get shot down. So we were on a mid cap mission up north <clears throat> and, uh, took off, uh, tanked, and started going to our our, our, our park at our rear cap station up north, uh, and our, our, our position was right over, was uh, between Kep, which was their major MiG base, and Haiphong, where the strike was going to win against some petroleum and industrial and, and uh, military targets there in Haiphong Harbor. Uh, we had just crossed the coast, started in toward our our cap station when we got a call from our controller on a ship out in the Tonkin Gulf, the USS Biddle, and uh, we had a discrete uh, frequency with him, our controller, and he said, uh, Rock River, that was our squadron call sign, Rock River, he said, you have bandits, 38 miles, 278, 38 miles, which meant that the big activity was starting, that the strike was coming into the, into the harbor. So he gave us a vector of two, seven, and eight, 30 some miles. So off we went, following his, his direction into where he was saying there were bandits. And it was unusual for him to immediately see a bandit. The call sign bandit meant a confirmed MIG. Normally they would call it a bogey, and then you would usually have to visually identify it before you could shoot at it. I mean, great rules of engagement, right? We got long distance missiles, but you still have to have an eye on it shooting. One of the, never mind. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, we thought that was strange and we, I called back to the, our controller and I said, crankcase, they said, uh, did you say confirm bandits? He said, yes, confirm bandits. You're clear to shoot, you're clear to fire. So that was, we didn't have to worry about IDM. Unfortunately, the, the F4 Phantom was not, did not have a good radar over, over land. And a lot of the ground clutter, the BQ-72 was not an overland uh, radar. And so as we were storing in there, uh, we could not pick up anything. We kept following the controller's uh, directions to, uh, to the merge. And right at the last minute, about 10 miles out, I finally got a, a paint on the uh, radar but I couldn't lock it up because of the ground clutter. But by that time it was too late anyway because the closure rate between us and, and the bandits was such that uh, soon after that we were merge plot. And uh, on pilot mugs he said, Tally Hill on the nose, uh, five miles all low. And all of a sudden two big 19s, two big 19s, uh, came right down between us. We were in combat spread, mile and a half, mile and a quarter apart. Came down between us, and uh, Monks called for a cross turn. We'll go high, you go low. Rookie and, and Ken were our, our wingmen. And uh, we turned thinking that we were going to be on the tail of these 19s. And instead of that, we broke into four big 17s. What they had done. The MiG-19s were bait, and we turned on them, and the MiG-4s, the 17s, were behind them. 
their game plan was for us to turn on the 19s, which we did. We made a mistake. We forgot to clear behind them. Things came out. Oh, boy, here we go. So uh, instead of turning and being between the two elements, we broke right into the formation of four big 17s. And uh, that's where the uh, excrement hit the air conditioning system at that time. So we broke into them, and then it was just a big ball, a fur ball. From then on, we uh, we turned on uh, Monks saw one of the 19s had gone through and come back through the fight. He started to turn on it. In the meantime, of course, I'm out of the cockpit now. Once the merge popped, the radar's no good anymore. You can't. So it's eyeballs only, and uh, I'm out checking our six. And as he's turning on the big 19, I see a big 17 coming up at our 8 o'clock and uh, tracking it, starting to shoot. And I said, Mugs, 8 o'clock, tracking, shooting, you know, do some of that pilot shit. And um, so uh, he looked back and he started to turn. He started turning off of the, the 19 and turned back in to break the tracking solution of the 17. And the controls he put in the airplane were so violent that uh, the airplane departed and did a backflip, complete backflip in the air. And uh, when we pulled out of it, we finally scooped out about 2,000 feet or so, I think. And there in front of us was a big 17. Wow, what a, what a wonderful thing to see. We took a shot at it and uh, with a sidewinder, heat seeking missile. And uh, either one of his, uh, his wingmen or some called it off or he saw it, he broke and we missed. And uh, so we turned, kept turning, turning, we got behind another 17. Again, we tried to shot and uh, he too deferred, defeated the missile. We were probably right on the edge of the envelope anyway, but anyway, so we were two, two, zero for two at that time. Boy, we were feeling pretty bad. Uh, so he started turning again, he saw another 17, but by this time I was looking at my 4 o'clock and there's another big 17 and this guy was really in close and he was already starting to fire. And I pulled another 4 o'clock track in the chute again, some of that pilot stuff. And so he broke hard into the, the big to break his tracking solution. And when he did that, the big turned up violently so he could stay inside of our, our, our arc. The big 17 could turn inside the, the turning radius of the Phantom. So the Phantoms, we wanted to fight a vertical fight, not get into a horizontal fight with these guys, because they could defeat us in horizontal, but they couldn't climb like we could. But we had no opportunity to climb. So he broke into him, and the guy just came up like that, thinking, well, they're eventually going to come out here, and I'll get a shot anyway. Muggs immediately realized where he was looking at the belly of that 17 and that big bulb of snow so that that guy can't see us right now. So he came in, came in to throttle, put the throttles in idle, pushed about two G's from there, G's, and we just started building separation. This guy keeps turning, thinking that we're going to find him from in front of him. Instead of that, we're going away from him. Pretty soon he starts looking for us, but by that time, We'd been scooped around behind him like this, and we had a clear shot. Got off our shot and uh, went right up the tailpipe. And we saw him eject, and uh, that was our first kill of the day. As we did that, I remember it, I remember it. <laughs> and uh, we looked across the circle, and as I told you, when uh, we first came to the merge, we went high, and Rookie and Kim went low. They spent the rest of that fight down in the street tops with a big on their, their tail the whole time. And after we got our kill there, we looked at him and we saw a uh, Meg 17 on their tail chasing them along. So we called him to break and to uh, come east. And we were up here, they're down here. We did a big barrel roll, came down behind him, and they kept dragging him. And got behind the other big shine off his tail. So that was our second kill of the day. Uh, we looked around, there were no more bigs around, and uh, 
we had had enough for the day. Decided to get out of Dodge, and we joined up and uh, came back, uh, tanked on the way back, came back and landed uh, on, on Midway. So that was uh, that was our thrill of victory of, of the day. Uh, it's uh, it took me more to more time to tell, talk about it than it did. The fight the fight only lasted probably five or six minutes. Three speeds. We lost. We we used about uh, eighty-five or nine thousand pounds of gas in that fight, and uh, so it's uh, this the dog fights. They don't last that long, but uh, they're pretty pretty exciting. So uh, we came back, and then there's a picture of us standing in a race six on Midway in front of our uh, in front of our squadron mates, telling them how shit hot we are and what heroes we are. And but anyway, that was that was that day. Uh, Mugs then, we flew a few more until July. We kept flying. We'd been flying together for a year, so I mean we were just you know thinking alike. I mean it's a great teamwork. You you know you guys that fly uh, two seat airplanes, uh, you know how that works. You get to where you know what the other guys thinking about this. So. Uh, in July, though, he got orders out of the squadron. He came back and became the commanding officer of Taka when it stood up as a squadron. And I picked up another pilot, uh, Mike Doyle. I knew Mike from the community. I'd never flown with him before. And uh, so on uh, 25 August 1972, we were again, uh, we were the lead on another big cap, only it was farther down south in North Vietnam, not by him then, Nam Bin. And um, so we crossed the beach to go to our mid cap station, and we got taken under fire by every goddamn surface air missile in North Vietnam, I think. <laughs> but then we would just, I remember at least three of them that we successfully dodged. And I was looking behind me, as one of them going behind us, and all of a sudden there was a big explosion over the cockpit. And the next thing I know, I'm I'm sitting there with uh, shards of the canopy and shrapnel all over me. Uh, I've been had my hand up in the handhold, fighting the G's while I was operating the ECM gear down on, on the uh, panel. And uh, next thing I know, I'm sitting here with big bloody my left hand bloody bleeding all over me, and shards and everything all over the canopy and, and uh, shrapnel throughout my body. And, and <laughs> It's funny thing you remember. I remember my exact words. That I said, "Oh my God, no!" And I think embodied in that, that scream that I let out was that you know I was on my 285th mission, fourth combat cruise, and you know pretty soon you start being bulletproof, invincible. It's always going to happen to the other guy. It's not going to happen to you. And something was happening to me, uh, but. Navy training kicked in right in immediately. I went into went on the intercom. And I said, "Mike, can we get to the water? Can we get to the water?" Thinking that we could get back out over the water before we had to eject, so we could get picked up. I looked up through the cockpits, looked at him, and I realized he was no longer flying that airplane. Here we were, about 4,000 feet, going down about 30 degrees or so, and doing about 450, maybe 500 knots. And he was slung forward in the cockpit, not flying the airplane. So I immediately went down between my legs and grabbed the motor and then handled my good hand, ejected us from the, cock from the cockpit. We had command ejection, which uh, either cockpit could eject both seats. Uh, I remember the kick in the butt of the uh, ejection seat going off. And then the next thing I remember was silence. I was floating in my chute. I'm sure I probably passed out for a little minute. And I'm hanging in the chute, just completely quiet. Because it's, boy, it was nice. And I'm gonna start looking around again, maybe training. I looked around, checked my chute. One panel was gone, but it was, it was still a good chute. Um, I looked around, I saw the airplane crash, and I looked over and I saw Mike's, uh, help with his part of the chute too, so I know that we got saw the airplane, okay. And I started reaching for our survival radio, 
to make a call to my wingman, let him know that I was alive. That was an important thing. Make sure that you, you know, that they knew you were alive when you were down there. So um, then I realized that when I was doing it, I fed my radios up here in my survival vest. And I'm looking around, surveying them where I'm going to land, which was rice paddies. Uh, but I realized that the hand wasn't doing what the computer was telling me to do, and I looked down, and the violent uh, ejection, of course I, I couldn't use the curtain, I had the uh, alternate handle between my legs. And when I hit the wind stream at that speed, it dislocated both elbows and pushed about halfway up inside of each arm. And so there I am hanging there, coming down, uh, and it's, uh, I always say, I came back to war a little short-handed. That's where I got call sign fingers. I lost my thumb, but they took it. And uh, so uh, I'm trying to survey my landing and see what, you know, what's going to go on. And then I realized, I heard these funny sounds going by me, and I looked down, and they were shooting at me, and they'd shoot as I was coming down. And uh, I pretty much thought, well, this is it. But, Luckily, they were not very good shots, or I was in the air long enough, or a combination of both. I didn't get hit. Landed in a rice paddy, fought my head out from underneath the water, and screwed it over against one of those walkways that separated into sections, brought my head up against it, and uh, again, the sounds, the water around me, flipping around there, so they shoot at me. So I, I pretty much said, okay, God, here I come. Shooting stopped. I heard it sloshing through the water. Pretty soon they came up, took me out of the rice paddy to a dry, dark, dry area nearby. Stripped me out all my equipment, boots, and everything, uh, right down to my underwear. Um, I don't think they got the concept of the zipper because everything was cut off. Uh, we were shot down in a home late afternoon. So it was probably about two hours before sunset or so, maybe less than that. Uh, they kept me over there in a little uh, thatched uh, hut, so it was, uh, with open sides. And uh, while I was laying there, a uh, kind old gentleman came up, held my head up, and gave me some cold tea, some liquid to drink, because I was I was starting to go into shock. You know? And uh, a kind young Vietnamese lady, she had a, a like a uh, first aid kit, you might carry your car or something like that. And she took my thumb, which was partially severed, but it wasn't all the way off, tucked it back in the, the palm of my hand and wrapped it around and around and around the gauze until it would not be moving and popping as they uh, moved me and started to help stop some of the bleeding. After dark, they loaded me onto a litter and took me, I want to say maybe a mile or so, uh, through the, the countryside till we got to a, a road, a paved road, and waiting there for me were the uh, were uniformed soldiers, two or three of them. And uh, they turned me over to them, they blindfolded me, and threw me in the back of the truck, turned up the tarpaulin, and we started driving toward him home. We made a couple of stops, uh, mostly because they had to get off the road because the good guys were bombing the roads, uh, uh, looking for uh, trucks going south. Um, finally, that night, we got up to Hanoi, and I uh, got put into the uh, Wallow Prison, which was an old French prison, and uh, that's what we called Hanoi Hill. <clears throat> I went in there. They put me in a room uh, somewhere near the, here's the uh, picture of it, I'm sorry I can't, but it's on that far side over here. Right up in that area. It's where I was. It's where I was taken, put into a room there about 12 by 12, I guess, something like that. I had a, um, a desk, a chair, a stool. And a waste can over in the corner for your bodily waste. And uh, threw me on the floor and um, 
left them out the door. So then I'm there to contemplate my fate. And an uh, hour or two maybe later, they came in, grabbed the, uh, the guards grabbed me by my arms, make me sit on the stool in front of the table, and the interrogator comes in, sits in the chair, and holds the book and starts the quiz. We call it quiz. It's very hard to study for. And uh, so name, rank, serial number, date of birth. After that, he started asking more questions about uh, targets in the area that we might be, I might know about uh, being planned to get uh, airplane capabilities, uh, names of my commanding officer, my tag, um, things like that. Which I told him, I said, I can't tell him. I can't tell you a name, name rank, and silver, serial number because of data on that. My date of birth because of the Chief Convention. That's all I have to tell you. I said, please, I'm, I need medical attention. By this time, you know, I was, I was hurt the puppy that day. And uh, so uh, he uh, kept insisting I answer these questions. And I said, I can't do that. It's good conduct. And uh, after about, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes of this, he stood up, left the room, cars came over, kicked me off the stool back onto the concrete. And uh, this routine went on for the next three days. They come in every so often, so many hours, jerk me up, took me in the stool. It was, it was always the same interrogator. I mean, they had a watch bill. I was on watch all the time. And, uh, they, again, they kept insisting that I answer questions and, and give the propaganda. And I said, I can't do that. But one of them told me, he said, you know, if you're not cooperating with us. I said, please, I need medical attention. Look at me. My arms are starting to discolor from the lack of circulation. This bloody mess over here, I didn't know what the hell was underneath there. And I was, I was slipping in delirium sometimes. I was, you know, I didn't know what I was doing sometimes. And, uh, he said, uh, I said, well, I need medical attention. He said, uh, we will not give you medical attention until you answer our questions and cooperate with us. And cooperate is a big word, and you must cooperate. So toward the end of this, these three days, and oh, and he told me, he said, no, you know, you're dying. We just let you die if you don't cooperate. And uh, so in between these sessions, I thought, wow, I, you know, I guess I am dying. I, I don't want to, but I don't know what else to do. Uh, I had a wife and three kids at home, certainly. You know. So I decided, okay, I want to make a little plan for myself. Next time they come in, I'll start answering some of these questions that I figure are of no value to them. And uh, if, if it's something I think is worthwhile, I'll just double on it. And lo and behold, I worked. After that session, they left again. An hour or so later, I guess, they came back, jerked me up off the floor, blindfolded me, and took me out of there. And I, I heard gates opening and closing, so I'm sure we were out of the prison bed. And they took me to a medical facility someplace there. And oh, probably the same one, John McCain's hospital, because that's the only one I think of that they had. Uh, took me into a room, strapped me down to a table, uh, like an op examining, a, a medical examining table. I had leather straps around my ankles, my thighs, and two or three uh, physician's assistants, I'll call them, came in and held my head and shoulders in place. And a doctor came in, took, up, took the gauze off of his hand, looked at it, went over and got a scalpel, started amputating my thumb. No anesthetic, no nothing, no bullet in my head, I know nothing. I'd like to say that I just bit the bullet, you know, instead of John Wayne, you know, hey, Pilgrim, what you doing? I didn't. I screamed and I said, please, give me something. This pain is killing me. And he said something to the effect that uh, no anesthetic, you have caused suffering in our country, now there's time for you to suffer. Okay, so that's that was the plan. He amputated my thumb, packed the wound, and wrapped it up in the gauze. They unstrapped me from the table, took me to another room, and um, they, they took some, I don't know what the hell, they call it, fluoroscope, is it? It was kind of a pre-X-ray or something.
shot my gun. And he kind of looked at the films of my dad and he put them down. And he uh, put me in a chair against the wall and his assistants held me in place. And he came over, <laughs> put his foot in my chest, grabbed my arms and started pulling them until they popped back in place. Wrapped him up in a few uh, rudimentary splints, uh, blindfolded me and took him back to the prison. So that was my, that was my early Obama care. <coughs> And uh, so uh, I was then put into a, a, a place. Um, I went back to that same room for a few more days. And then they put me into a bamboo hut in the, right in the center of the Hanoi, the, the uh, one part of the prison, which we call Camp Unity. And it was surrounded by great big 40, 50 men cells right in the middle of the courtyard was this this hut. Part of it was a supply place and the other was an interrogation room. And I was staying there. I spent 30 days in solitary finally. And again they provided uh, they wanted me to write letters and make tapes uh, up against the war while I was in there and I I, I just pleaded, hey I, I can't do anything my arm but I successfully uh, supported the mayor. They caught me communicating with some of the other POWs that were in the big rooms around. And uh, then all hell broke loose, and I thought, oh boy, here we go. But it was almost like once I made contact with the other POWs, it was as if my uh, my value of exploitation was gone because I made contact with the other people. So about an hour later, they came, collected me and what bigger things I had with me. And, Cup and um, mat, took down the mat or whatever we slept on, and uh, put me in with another room, room five, and there were about 50 other guys in there, some of whom I knew that had been shot down before me, uh, and so then I was finally in with some other Americans. And uh, I'm not ashamed to say that I sat down and cried, and uh, I was, you know, I'm in with somebody else, and I went to the I went to the senior resident officers. Each each cell, the senior guy in each cell was in charge of everything, no matter what uh, what rank. I mean, what uh, service he was in, highest ranking was in charge. And the guy there was kept was current lieutenant colonel Joe Kippinger. And uh, I went up to him and I said, to the "Sir, I said I, I I broke the code of conduct and I told him more than I was supposed to." Feel terrible about it. And then he laughed and he said that. He said, Jack, he says, we all do. He says, everybody reaches a point where they can do what they can. Very few can really go through all the way. There are a few that uh, that did early to that is that uh, they tortured him to death before they never got anything out of him. But uh, I wasn't one of them, thank God. So that was uh, that was my introduction to uh, prison life. And in the, in the meantime, uh, Kathy and the girls, all the lawyer can tell what they were doing while I was having the, the first of my unaccompanied shore duty tour. <laughs> I think of myself as three different things. At first of all, I'm a mother and now a grandmother. Jack was shot down. When Jack was shot down, our children, we had three daughters, and they were one, three, and seven. So. Yeah. So we were pretty much accustomed to um, Jack being gone, being already gone six months at, at that time. But anyway, um, I also think to myself, I also have, these children are now grown, and I have five grandchildren. So that's a big, big part of my life. I'm also a teacher. Um, I taught San Diego Unified for a while and, and the county office of Ed. And my last job, I was teaching kids when they came to the Midway on a field trip. And that was the best, best teaching ever. I love that. I love sharing the Midway with them. And I'm also a sister, a Navy wife. And a part of that sisterhood, and I, I know it's very dear to me. I have friends now that were 
friends then. I mean, we're still in, we're still friends. We're still in contact. My my biological sister didn't have a clue what my life was like, but my Navy sisters did, and we supported one another. And as you know, that's that's a wonderful organization to belong to. So I'll have to set the scene a little bit about what what life was like, what the climate was like at the time. Um, there, um, it, it's hard for you to understand that, that the, the country was divided much like it is now. People were very, very unhappy with the war. They were in the streets protesting. They were, they were having riots in, high, in colleges and so on. They, so as a Navy family, we didn't talk too much about what Daddy was doing. We had a pretty low profile. Um, also, the, the other thing that, that we need to understand is there was no internet. And I know that's that's even hard for me to understand. Imagine if no internet anymore. But there was no communication. Our communication was old-fashioned, pencil and pen and paper. I mean, we, we wrote letters every other day, and I even numbered them because if a mailbag went overboard or if he got mailbag and it was full of a week's worth of mail, he wouldn't know which one to read first. And I wanted him to know that the dishwasher had been fixed before it was broken. So he, he got, he, we, we numbered them. Um, so we did keep a very low profile. Um, in fact, the, the Navy, or the, the Vietnamese, even came out and said, we probably can't win this war on the battlefield, but we can win the propaganda war. And they, they were winning, because in the streets of San Francisco, uh, New York, Washington, D.C., people were really unhappy, and they were protesting in the city, and the United States was divided. So the other thing about no internet was, there was no cable news. So for me to find out what was going on in the war, you listen to Walter Cronkite at six o'clock every night. And that's how we found out what was going on. Uh, and again, that's hard for us to understand. It? So, it's so different than it was then. So there was no communication, no internet, no, no email between Jack and I, just letters. And even telephone calls were, were very, very expensive. So a lieutenant couldn't afford the $100 a minute kind of calls that overseas calls would have been at that time. So, we depended strictly upon letters and, and, and managed that way. Um, I was pretty accustomed to Jack being gone. This was, as I said, his third cruise. He'd already been gone fourth. six months. Fourth, his fourth cruise. And he'd already been gone six months. And so the girls and I had a routine, and we were pretty comfortable with that. And the girls were comfortable with the fact that Daddy wasn't home all the time. Um, so when the black car arrived at my house at 7 o'clock at night, I was not, uh, I knew what was going on. I knew exactly what was happening. Four people got out of that car. One was a PACO officer, which is a ca uh, casualty assistance officer that the Navy assigned to me. And every spouse that had that sort of experience, and a, a missing spouse, was assigned to PACO. And he was to act as a li liaison between the Navy and, and myself, and provide me with any kind of information that he could. Um, uh, he, he, and with him was also a chaplain. And there was a, the EXO's wife. The CO's wife was, was out of town, so the EXO's wife had to come. And the last one was a, um, the seal of the base at NAS Miramar, at NAS at the time. He was a friend of ours. So those are the four people. And they told me what they could tell me. They told me they'd seen two shoots and that there was, was no, uh, no radio contact. So they did not know whether he had survived the, the ejection. So his status was missing in action. And I received a, 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 a telegram the next day telling me that he was MIA. So for about the first day, I went through, what am I going to do? I've got these three kids. I've got all this stuff I have to handle and all the things. How am I going to do this without Jack? And then an hour or so later, I'd say, no, I think he's going to make it. He's going to be OK. And I vacillated back and forth between that. And after about a day of it, I was exhausted. I couldn't do that. I said, I, I can't do this. I, so I'm a pretty practical German <laughs> race girl. And, and I said, you know, as far as I'm concerned, Jack is alive until they tell me he's not. When the Navy tells me that he's dead, then I'll deal with it then. And it was much easier dealing with the girls at that time because I could say when Daddy's coming home, not if Daddy's coming home. So that worked well with me. The girls were pretty easy as far as dealing with it. The infant, obviously, she was just a year old. She didn't have a clue. The four-year-old was just confused. She just knew Daddy wasn't going to be home when he was supposed to. Lots of people coming and going at our house, so she really was pretty confused. 
but she was starting nursery school, so she was looking forward to that. It was a bit of a diversion for her, and uh, that, that helped a great deal. Now, the seven-year-old, she was going into the third grade, so before she went into school, I was shot down the end of August, so when school started, I went and talked to the teacher. I explained what the situation was. I wanted her to know that Jack was a prisoner of war, not a prisoner because he held up a bank. And I wanted to make sure that the children didn't tease or, you know, bully or whatever. I wanted her to know what was going on. Now, uh, I went in October for open house, and Beth was a very good student. There were her workbooks with her work undone, complete, incomplete, scratched, and, and not, not at all which is, uh, completed. And then, can I use my microphone? Can you still hear me? No. So I, and in the margins of the, the uh, workbooks, she had, thank you, she had drawn pictures of airplanes crashing and of parachutes coming down. Parachutes coming down, so she was obviously traumatized, and that teacher never said a word to me. And I think she was one of those who didn't approve of the war, and they equated military families with the war. So um, the best thing I could do for Beth was to get her a new teacher, which I did immediately. The other thing that you uh, have so many resources available to you today that were not there, that I was on my own. There were, there were no counselors, there were no I just took Beth home and, and loved her a lot and told her how proud I was of her and how her daddy had always been proud of her being such a good student that she needed to keep up her work so that when daddy came home, when daddy came home, he, she could show him what she'd been doing. So that seemed to, to, to register with her and the new teacher was much, much better to help the situation completely. So that was my dealing with, with the girls. So Jack remained missing in action until we were, we went, the girls and I went home for that, for Christmas with our families, and we were going to spend Christmas with Grandma and Grandpa. And I received a call on the 23rd of December from my cable officer saying that Jack's status had been changed to POW. And at the time, I didn't know why, but I found out later that there were some POWs that received letters and their wives were writing back and forth, and there was a coding going on, and they were, they were able to get initials out and so on. So they knew that Jack was, was alive. And that made all the difference in the world to me, as you could imagine. Um, that was my Christmas present, too. <laughs> it didn't cost me anything except a thumb. <laughs> okay. I had lots of support during that time. All the military wives in the squadron. I stayed with the squadron. They were on cruise, so we continued doing the same things we'd always been doing until the men came home. And then it was a little awkward because they had husbands and I didn't. So but we still remained friends in Ann Archie to this day, a couple of them. But then the other support I had was from the POW wives. And the POW wives welcomed me into their, into their fold and told me a few things that I, I needed to know that, that were very helpful. And these ladies are my heroes because what I was experiencing for a matter of months, they had been enduring for years some of them five and six years, and they had been given very little support from the government. They were supposed to be getting information, and there was very little information coming, and they just felt like they had, had really worked and worked and were, were not getting anywhere. So Sybil Stockdale, as a leader, said enough. And she did an interview with the San Diego Union, and that broke the ice. She told them exactly what was going on and how the, the POWs were actually being tortured they were not being well cared for. They didn't have good medical care. They didn't have good food. And their conditions were really bad. And it woke up the American public. And as a result, other wives did this too. The wives on the East Coast, Jane Denton and others on the East Coast, did the same thing. And it sort of ballooned. And they were writing letters to the representatives explaining all of this stuff to them. And the one thing, they were asking for three things. They wanted an accountability from the Vietnamese so that they knew who was there and who wasn't, and they had never done that. And they also wanted them to acknowledge the um, articles of the, of, the, of, the, of the Geneva Convention. And they wouldn't do that, Vietnam didn't do that, because they didn't. Say, they said it was not a declared war. Congress had not declared it, so they didn't. But that was one of the things, that the second thing that the wives were looking for, 
recognize the articles of the Geneva Convention. And the third one was better conditions, better, better health, better medical, better food, and those are their three goals. And the thing that, that impressed me so about all of these ladies was that they did it all with dignity. You will see pictures of uh, Sybil Stockdale in a bright pink suit, and they were wearing gloves and hats, and these ladies were ladies. They did it with dignity. There was no whining, there was no sniveling. They, they, they were determined, and they had a common goal, and they worked toward it. And I'm really very, very proud of them. And I really think deep inside that if it hadn't been for them, raising the awareness of the American public that we might not have gotten my husband might not have gotten home. Who knows? But there's a wonderful book that I will step aside here and tell you about. It's called uh, League of Wives. It's written all about Sybil and the group of wives and what they did and what they endured and how they did that. And, and it really is a, a, a wonderful resource for you to, to read. It's not long or anything, but it will tell you a lot about what they went through and how they, they accomplished what they did. About that same time, two or three other prisoners were released. And they, because of medical reasons, and one of them was Doug Hagdahl. He was an enlisted man who had fallen overboard on his, his and he was captured and sent to Hanoi. Well, most of the people in Hanoi were officers. And here's this enlisted kid, right? 18, right out of high school. And so the Vietnamese started questioning him. And well, he was smart enough to act like a doofus. And if he acted like a doofus, they wouldn't ask him anymore. So he could ask them, what do you mean? Can you spell that for me? So, so they finally went, right? And didn't ask him any more questions. And then they started treating him pretty well. And his roommates uh, stopped. Right. Dick Stratton said that, uh, I think they're getting you ready to go home. And wouldn't that look nice for the Vietnamese to be so humanitarian to send this young sailor home and they'd fallen over the board. And so they, he, he was right. They were, they were trying to get him ready to go home and they did release him early. But Doug also had one other talent and he was able to memorize the name of all the POWs that were in, that they knew of. And of course this communication that Jack's gonna tell you about in a moment, you'll see, they were able to give him the names, and he learned them all to the tune of Mary Had a Little Lamb. So he, he would sing the song and say the words, so he knew all that. So when he and the other POWs came home, they, they appeared before the uh, Congressional um, Armed Services Committee and told exactly what was going on. So the American public was now not aware of it. And they were really getting behind it, saying, wait a minute, these people are American citizens. You can't treat them like that. And there was something at least they could do in this awful war that you know didn't seem to have an end. So they sort of got behind it, and, and they they next they uh, they bought. There was a, an organization called Viva that set up that you could buy a bracelet with a POW's name on it, and you could ask for a name of someone that you knew, or you could just take a random name. And if you wore that bracelet, then you were to pray and to think for that, think positive about that person. Thousands of those were sold. In the short time that Jack was a POW, we received it, when he came home, we received over 600 of them back, just in that short time. So that tells you how the American public really got behind this. And the, uh, the POW wives, those legal wives that we were talking about earlier, they made this flag. And one of the ladies who was in helping make it, her name is Carol Hickerson, I said, she said, you know why it's all black and white? And I said, well, it was so sober, it was a somber occasion. She said, no, she said, we just couldn't afford the colors. <laughs> so that's why that flag is black and white. Right. So the American public came around, and as a result, when the peace talks began, those POWs became a pawn in that re those negotiations. And as a result, they came home. So Jack's going to tell you now about what it was like a day in prison was like. Heroes uh, thrown around an awful lot uh, out of context, I think, but those women that she just talked to you about, those are real heroes because they put, if I hadn't been for them, and uh, a lot of the uh, treatment would have not come about, and uh, I'm sure that some of the guys wouldn't have come, wouldn't come home. So, okay, uh, a day in the life of uh, but well, one thing uh, that was very important to us over there 
uh, and their leadership, the Stockdale, you know, Flynn, and all of all of Denton, and all of them, that were separated from us, uh, FNGs, if you will, uh, they would, you know, they were all sequestered away from the rest of the junior officers. But the communication system was important, and the military bearing was important. We had a military structure in every, every, uh, Cell, as I said, the senior prison officer of each cell was in charge of that. We were sectioned off into four sections that uh, you didn't you had daily chores you had to do, like let's say uh, we call them, they call them flights. Like you said, flight A, B, C, and D is flight A. Maybe uh, that, that week was your job would be uh, to go get the food, maybe it was, and put it out in the plates, ration it out, make sure everybody got the same amount. Doing that, maybe flight B would be uh, emptying the uh, the waste can at the barrel that we use at the end of the mine. But you'd have to take that out of the cell and take, take it down to the store and dump it and bring it back, and also cleaning up the uh, mess. Um, another one would be uh, maybe sweeping the or washing the dishes uh, outside in the cistern that they had there. Side of each cell, and they might be, they have a KP duty, if you will, and uh, the others would be. So, and that rotated around, so you were, were kept busy. You didn't just sit around and, and twiddle your thumb. Well, you didn't have to uh, uh, just think of it you know, yourself. Uh, so, you, you were busy doing something all the time. But they, the routine would be uh, they'd get you up early in the morning, probably about 6 o'clock in the morning. Gong would go off in the in the, the uh, courtyard, and the guards would come along and they would open up each cell one at a time. The guys would come out and get the food, take it back in, and, and distribute it. Then they'd lock you back up again, and they go to the next cell and they do the same thing. They didn't they didn't let everybody out at the same time. Each cell came out, did their stuff, went back in, and so on and around for you know what ten cells of 50, 40, 50 people each. And uh, and then uh, about oh noon something like that they come around again and they'd open it up and you come out and you get your your midday meal which was uh, often what something was left over for breakfast uh, maybe it was some rice and stuff in it and then you would be locked up again and then in the evening. No, five o'clock or something like that. Out again, you need to get your third meal of the day. Very meager rations, but uh, you know it's, a, it's all you had to do. You know, all you had to eat. Uh, and then in the meantime, you were you were locked up inside the, the cell. I mean, it, you were just uh, probably oh locked up uh, 20, 22 hours of the day most of the time. And there was a light bulb in, two light bulbs in every big cell that were on 24 hours a day. You were never in the dark. And uh, we had concrete buttons uh, along each, each side. I think I have a picture of that here somewhere. Yeah. And uh, that's where you slept. You put your little, your, your uh, straw mat on that, laid down on there, and Used uh, your other clothes again. Usually had two two sets of striped pajamas, and uh, one could be you could wash while you're wearing the other one back and forth. You wash, they let you wash them maybe once a week. And you would use your other uh, what you weren't wearing. You roll up and use as your belt. So it was uh, it wasn't it wasn't uh, the high or the Sheraton or anything like that. We called it the Hilton, but it wasn't. Uh, and so that's that's how we pretty much the day was pretty boring really. And uh, communications we uh, when the, uh, the Vietnamese, much like the French, the Spanish, you know, the European, they, they take a siesta in the afternoon, so they take the naps and rest. That was our communication time. And then we would tap them, tell them, you know, spread the word coming down from uh, the senior officers everything like that, tapping, or we would use the uh, signal code. 
tap code The tap code was a, um, it was a matrix, five across, five down. What you do, you, uh, you throw out the throw out the K because the C makes the same cuss sound as that. So you had five and five. So if you wanted to, if I wanted to tap A, it would be column, row, A, B, and so forth. And so you would spell it out, spell out each word. And if, if a guy knew what, what you, the word that you were trying to say, he'd give you a, and you could stop, he knew what that word you could get in your sentence. Uh, pretty complicated, but until you, some of these guys got to go on them. <laughs> One of the guys made a comment that during siesta time, he said, uh, the prison sounded like a, a, a nest of woodpeckers everybody tapping back and forth and everything. So that's that's how we got the, the word around. Oh, there's the tap code. Okay, go back. Okay. All right. Uh, it's interesting, I find the tap code, I was, you know, I was, I was very fortunate. I was shot down on my fourth combat cruise in 19, my first cruise in Vietnam was 1966. i have been shot down then. I've been there for seven years. So seven years, seven months. Uh, I was pretty damn lucky not to have been there a long time. But um, the tap code is something that really sticks in my craw a bit, is that that was not taught to us in Surrey school. The tap code accidentally got into the POW and I hope, and the field is with it. There's a guy named Smitty Harris, a good old boy from Tupelo, Mississippi. He was a 105 thud driver, and he was shot down. He was one of the, about the first 10 guys shot down over Vietnam. And when he was going through Air Force Surrey School, he, uh, you guys can relate to this, you guys in the house are fired. Uh, he was on a break. And he was talking to one of the instructors, and they, they, they were talking about the importance of communication. Communication is the lifeblood of the POW situation because that's how you, if you can't get the word around, you know, how to resist or what they're looking for. If a guy goes out for a quiz and they're, they're asking him certain questions, something like that, and you know that somebody else is going to be, you could say, hey, okay, watch out for this. This is what they're looking for. So that's the way you could thwart them. Well, Smitty is talking to this instructor, and they were talking about the communications. And the instructor told me, he says, well, the RAF uh, pilots over in uh, Europe, uh, they had themselves a little uh, tap code that they could communicate with. Smitty says, well, you mean Morse code? And I said, no, no, everybody knows Morse code. I mean, the Germans knew it, everybody knew it. And they came up with this tap code thing. And uh, Smitty remembered that. When he was shot down, he was he was isolated for, in solitary for a while. Finally, he got put in with another guy who was um, a shoemaker, uh, who was a F-8 by a second guy shot down, and they happened to be a, put this up together. And Smitty starts telling him about this tap code and teaching him you know, how to make the five, five, roll, and, and palms. And over there, they were always moving people. You know, you move a guy from this cell or to that cell or this prison to that prison. And unbe you know, unwittingly, they didn't know what they were doing, but they were spreading the tap code throughout the POW system without them even knowing. And when a shoemaker got moved to someplace else, he talked to somebody else, and they talked to somebody else. And pretty soon, everybody knew the tap code, and that's how we communicated the tap code. And to, I say it sticks in my craw. The Siri people knew about this code and did not teach it in Siri school before they sent guys over to combat. And I thought that was unconscionable. They had to happen. If somebody hadn't been shot down, there might not have been a tap code in, in 
thinks a little bit differently. So I'm gonna get off my soapbox right now. Oh yeah. Oh, I forgot, yeah. Uh, Smitty wrote a book, his tap code, that's it. You can find it on Amazon, anything like that. It's a remarkable story about him and his wife, who was, uh, she is a steel magnolia from the South. And uh, they still live in Tupelo, Mississippi. They're in their 90s now. And uh, they're just, uh, I, I highly recommend this book if you want. Well, I don't know. Okay, so that was kind of the, you know, I won't bore you with the, the daily routine, but that was kind of it. I mean, you didn't, there wasn't much to do. You sit around and, and talk and, and walk, walk way up and down. The cells were, oh, probably, as long as this uh, room right here, and about half as wide as these tables. And you had a walkway, you do a lot of walking and uh, exercising and stuff like that. So we had a routine and everybody would walk, keep their uh, physical fitness up as best they could. And uh, also another thing we had, uh, Hanoi Hill College, where to pass the time, some guys, were very uh, knowledgeable about a lot of things. You know, one guy in my my uh, cell was uh, he had uh, studied in France and he, he was knew French, so he would get some guys over in one corner or thing like that and be teaching con conversational French. You know, uh, if somebody's wanted to do that. Another guy was uh, he was a Civil War buff. And he knew a hell of a lot about the Civil War and all the battles and you know that stuff. And he'd get somebody over and think guys wanted to do that, and they would be over there and he would be teaching them about the Civil War, things like that that uh, were just to keep your mind moving and, and not dwell on your situation. So that's that's kind of how we did things. And we had movies every Saturday night movie. Somebody would get up and they would tell a movie. And uh, I remember when I, I was, my turn to tell a movie, and I, I was telling one, and it was the one I had just seen on a ship before that. It was uh, Dustin Hoffman, and uh, I've got this beautiful blonde lady. I don't even know her name is now. But anyway, the, the movie, uh, it had a little uh, skin in it, as you can say. And, uh, so I was telling the story about he was doing this, and he'd say, okay, as a credits roll, we see blah, 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 blah. And then there's, there's this one scene where the lady is getting undressed, and somebody is in the apartment across from her and watching her, and she takes her blouse off, of course her breasts are exposed, and blah, 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 and she goes on. <laughs> this tells you how goofy we were sometimes. So I described that, that scene as best I could with him. You know, and then I started to go on with the rest of the story. One of the guys says, wait, roll it back. I want to see that again. <laughs> so that's, how, that's some of the goofy stuff that went on. So there was humor in, in prison. Um, this, this went on then until uh, September of uh, 72. Remember I told you about how they would lock and let one cell out and then the other. Finally, one day they came out and they opened up all the cells at once. And they let all the POWs, the old guys, the fogs, and the FNGs move and meet together. I met John McCann, the first time I ever met him in my life was in that courtyard when they let us all get up at Alvarez, some of the guys. And uh, they got together and we got to talk. It was a peace agreement. And then about October, early November, whatever it is, all of a sudden, it was back to one cell at a time. They wouldn't let us mix again with all in the group because the peace agreements had died down. And of course, the, the, the diplomats over there in, in, in France, in Paris, were, they were arguing about some pretty heavy things, you know. It took them, I think it was a, almost a month to decide what kind of table they were going to use. Because there was, 
Well, we can't have a long table like that because if somebody's sitting at the table, they're higher up than somebody down here. So you'll see the peace talks ended up with a circular table so that everyone's the same. In the meantime, we're getting our ass kicked over there in prison, and they're worried about the size of the table. Diplomats. Anyway, so then they locked us up again. And uh, finally, in uh, December 18th, um, we had just tucked ourselves in, and uh, all of a sudden, the biggest explosion you've ever wanted to hear in your life. Missile going off, gun, on the aircraft guns. Nixon didn't have enough. He sent the B-52s in. And I tell you, that was like 400, 4th of July's and New Year's Eve's and everything all put together. The concussion from those things were so, so violent. We actually were laying in our, in our bunks, I'll call it. And the impact on your nervous system was you were just involuntarily shaking. And, you know, we knew, <laughs> we basically hoped. We said, well, they know where the Hanoi Hilton is. We hope they know that. Well, we found out later they were using the Hilton as an off, off, on, you know, reference point bomb, make sure that they bombed all around it. And we, so they never did hit the, the prison, thank God. But that scared the Jesus out of the Vietnamese. They were digging holes, trying to crawl into them in the courtyard and everything. So that went on until um, 27th of January, finally, the uh, peace agreements were signed. And uh, we, uh, the Vietnamese then started moving us around they moved us, old, not him guys, FNGs, they moved us over in one corner of the, of the Hilton, in a place we call New Guy Village. And uh, that night we heard trucks coming up and the folks, the older guys, long timers were coming back from outlying prisons that they had them stuffed in. And they were starting to line us up by shooting down me. And the Hilton then was the, the, would be where the first guys were. So after that, they moved my group uh, over to a place called the Zoo, which was a, an old uh, French film uh, colony or some kind of uh, a movie studio that they turned into a uh, prison in the Hanoi, I mean, in the Hanoi area. And our group was moved over there, and uh, we were released from there. This is a picture of the the uh, zoo. And go ahead. Yeah. This was this was my quarters over there in the in the zoo. My, my cell. Um, you see the arrow pointing down. That's me peeking over uh, Mike Penn's uh, shoulder. When uh, whenever the photographers or anything would come around, we were always told to turn our back and not give them any any uh, propaganda and stuff like that. So I was the lookout. See my mangled hand hanging down there on the side. But uh, this was a few days before uh, we finally got out. But uh, you can see the accommodations were uh, sparse. But uh, that was a, a typical room in the zoo. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, when the peace agreement was signed, we got to the zoo. Several of us were called out, and they said, uh, you, have never, you haven't written home. But by the Geneva Convention, everybody was supposed to be able to communicate, write letters and receive letters. Well, there were a bunch of us who had never done so. So they brought us back, and they gave us this little this seven-line piece of paper, and said, you write home. And uh, I always laughed about it. I said, what they were doing is they were getting ready for an ad map. They were just gun decking the books so that they could say, oh, everybody got to write home. What are you talking about? Anyway, they got to write home and uh, they could never get get mail. But one of the earlier guys in my group was released uh, when he was picking up his gear to, to go home. And they had these things laying around, I guess. And he saw it and he spirited it away and got it home. And when he got home, he delivered that, that letter to 
County. So she did get a letter from me, but it was not through the post office. So then we came, came time for us to go home. And they, uh, they lined us up and they, they outfitted us with our go home clothes here, you know, those steady looking jackets and everything. Uh, they came with the buses, we loaded on the buses, took us out to Elon Airport, and uh, we were lined up, and uh, there were two, uh, that's me being released right there. You see the two tables, there was the U.S. and the Vietnamese, and the Kapathan Lao and the other Aleutians. And you would step forward, they call your name out, you would call your name, you'd step forward, each one of them would check off your name, Double County or one of the and uh, then walked out. I walked out to the uh, Air Force Colonel reporter, back to duty, escorted to the C one C one forty one to brought us back. I had never thought of the C one forty one as being a very pretty airplane, because I was just looking down there, but I'd seen them all. So we loaded up and took off. And uh, the next picture you'll see, I think, is it? Oh, there it is. Um, this is a picture. Now, when we got on the airplane, we sat there very stoically and uh, turned up the taxi and took off, and there was not a peep coming out of anybody. And because, <laughs> quite frankly, some of the guys said, you know, God, you know, they shot us down once, you don't suppose they shoot us down again, do you? And, uh, this picture was snapped as we left the coast of North Vietnam, and the pilot came up on the intercom and he said, gentlemen, we've just left North Vietnamese airspace. We're in international waters of the Pompey Gulf Eight, our Air Force Base. That was it. So we got to Clark Air Force Base, and uh, we got there, we spent a couple of days, uh, they were outfitting us with our, our service uniforms to come home. Uh, they gave us uh, quick uh, physicals, took care of any immediate thing that needed to be done. They started already working on my hand, trying to get it squared away. Uh, we got real American food, hamburgers, scrambled eggs, and um, they, uh, you know, just they took care of us and two days, I guess, and then we loaded up on uh, C-141, flew back to the United States, up to uh, uh, San Francisco, it's the, there was the name of the Air Force Base, it's up there, isn't it? And then waiting there were airplanes uh, in the Navy, they picked us up and dropped us off, and then took off, and they dropped some guys off of the moor, some of the A-4, the A-7 guys, and then down to Aramor. And I remind, I re I got home on April Fool's Day, 1973, and arrived at Vermont. Yeah. And, oh yeah, that's it. And you can imagine how excited we all were. And there were a lot of POW wives in San Diego. So we were, we were told what to expect and so on. But, um, First, they, they actually published a list with the name of all the great POWs that were coming home, which was, was amazing. And now, of course, look, the name is Jack, so I was happy about that. But his pilot's name was on it also, he did not come home, so it wasn't terribly accurate. But we were very excited. And up until this time, I had not received any mail from Jack until I got the letter that had come out earlier. And also, I had not heard his voice for over a year and a half, because he'd already been deployed for six months when he was shot down, and finally he was gone. So when I got a phone call from Clark Air Force Base, it was really very, very special just to hear his voice again. And he was very concerned about his injury, thinking that he was not whole, or that he was you know, damaged, and that how would I react to that? He was very concerned about that. He was also concerned about whether he would fly again, which you can understand. So, um, he, we talked a bit, and that, that really was wonderful. Allay his, his concerns and, and um, make plans for when he did come home. 
So I'm buying new clothes for the girls, and I'm cleaning up the house and doing all this special stuff, getting my hair done and all this good stuff. And, and um, we were told as Navy, as military wives, that we're in the San Diego area. We met out at Miramar, and we knew the theater out there. And they had the admirals and the, and the generals and the psychiatrists and the psychologists or whatever were all up on the stage, and they were talking down to us and telling us what to expect. And they said, you ought to be prepared that your husbands might be vegetables. I was going to do a rude thing. <laughs> but they based that on the data that they had from the Japanese from World War II and from Korea. And, and those people didn't do very well. They, they were obviously not treated well either. But compared to our men, they didn't have that communication. And they didn't have the military structure that made them feel like they were a part of a bigger goal and that they were going to be home and return of honor. I mean, that, that whole thing together. They didn't have that. So our men did much, much better than the authorities thought they would. So we were all so pleased to see them come home in such great shape. Uh, and that's because of those two things. And I think another thing was that most of the pilots that were shot down had a college degree. So that also helped them deal with the, the uh, circumstances that they found themselves in. So um, we were very, very pleased. I did receive a telegram saying that Jack would be coming home, so that's a pretty good thing to have after I had the other one, that he was, he was missing in action. So um, we were really, really happy. We went out to Miramar, and, met, met, and Jack's mother came to be with us, and, and the girls and I. And uh, we, had, we had a good visit. Glad that he was home and all that good stuff. Um, we were, we were all sort of taken back by the public's reaction. They were so delighted about this whole thing. And most people can tell you, if they're old enough, that where they were, and they, they watched the POWs coming off, the first ones, Jack, the Dentons, and, and, and uh, it, it really was a small victory from, from a terrible war. And I think that's probably what it was on my So, um, this is, this is a, a we had a neighbor that I wasn't too sure where he was with the board. And he, you know, he, he wasn't one that I would go and ask him to help me fix the, the dishwasher or whatever. He, um, but yet when Jack came home, this sign was on our garage door and he had put it there. And so people really did get behind the idea that he would have coming home. It really was quite, quite wonderful. And it's on display now at the, um, the Naval Aviation Museum in Pensacola. So you'll see a lot of Jack stuff there. I am out my closet, got rid of a lot of stuff. <laughs> the next picture will show you what the girls look like when Jack was shot down. And then this is a picture of what they look like now. Next. Oh, it's not there? Oh, there it is. This is what they, well, sort of like now. But anyways, 50 years, folks. It's been 50 years since they came. That first one was taken uh, the day after I got shot down in Balboa. When I came home, yeah. Balboa Hospital, and the Navy made these into uh, like a postcard. They gave it to us. This one side of it, you could write on it, because we got a lot of letters and the uh, bracelets. bracelets and everything back, so that we could write back to these people and say, hey, "This is my family." Thank you. And then this one. No, no, you are going down. Oops, wrong one. Well, I'm. Told you. This was taken uh, 22 years later. This was at my retirement, my last command in my and NTC. And you'll notice that the girls and Kathy and I, we were in the same positions as we were in the other ones. So that's, that's kind of, we didn't plan it that way. It was just, it kind of turned out that way. So anyway, that was, that was kind of cool. But basically we, we uh, consider ourselves quite fortunate. We count our blessings and, and uh, find, we found ourselves in a situation that you might find yourself in. And you think, well, how would you do that? Well, you would be surprised what you do when you're asked. So that, that's why we tell our story. So when I got back, I spent uh, uh, nine months at the uh, Naval Hospital in physical therapy and some minor operations here and there to get things working again. And uh, Kathy said, I, I was worried about it. I uh, get to fly again. And uh, had I been a pilot, I, I never would have been back to the cockpit, I know, because you no know, speed brakes, right? <laughs> and, uh, but I, I proved to the Navy that I could operate everything in the backseat of a fighter. 
the, the operator without that thumb. So I got back on on uh, flight status and uh, this this is kind of touchy. Anyway, I've always been a little bit uh, uneasy about all the adulation and everything that he on those POWs when got back. Because the average Vietnam veteran, when they got back, got off that airplane in San Francisco or wherever they came back, and they were spit upon and just, you know, just treated horribly. And then suddenly, we come home, and we don't want to screw up. Hell, we, we lost the airplanes, you know. I'm still waiting for the, still waiting for the bill for the F4 that I lost. But uh, the reason, how I finally came to grips with that in my mind, I think that we POWs represented to the American people the only physical, or tangible uh, victory that they thought came out of that war was getting our POWs back. Which, you know, I guess, I and mean, I think in part of it, that was it. But it's it's some kind of, it's a little embarrassing to be telling, you know, just had all this adulation at the point all of a sudden. But um, anyway, I uh, I got back in the cockpit, and, um, and uh, so after I got, in January of 74, uh, I was released from the hospital, back on flight status, and the Navy was going to send me that, that uh, in September to PG school to get a master's degree. And uh, I said, well, I don't want to do that. I better go back and fly. Well, I'm just, you know, needs of the Navy, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So I had three or four lunches there before they were going to send me the orders to PG school. And uh, Monks was still excellent uh, see what top there and at Miramar. So they say, well, we'll send you out to Miramar and you can uh, you go into 121 to the F4 rag and uh, you know, you can start getting some flights again and just, you know, be the SLJO, you know, Shiloh's Jones officer. And uh, so Monk says, uh, hey, no, send him over here to Top Gun. I might put him over. And so I went over there. I just made a lieutenant commander. I walked over there and uh, about oh, a week or so after I was there, the current XO at that time, Jerry Sawasi, who was also a um, squadron man at my own time, Jerry was having some very emotional problems and he was having marriage problems and everything. And the Top Gun is it was, it was a pretty intense uh, operation there. And I came into work one day and he said, uh, he said, hey, fingers, he said, uh, you're the XO, I'm leaving. I said, what? He was packing his bag. And he said, no, I said, I called once last night. He said, I, I just can't do this. He was a he was a NAVCAP. He was trying to get his degree, and he was having a marriage problem, and anything, a lot of things going on. And he says, it's not fair for me to be here talking because I can't do the job. So he quit. Most came in, and I said, he said, yeah. He said, you're XO until you go to PG school. Okay, so I started flying there, went back in uh, tactics and all this stuff. And about uh, two months later, I was sitting over to the old club having a beer. God, for a bit. Do they still do that? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was Friday night at our old club. Sitting there having a beer with folks and uh, Captain uh, Scotty Lamro, who was the uh, confit at EW. Wink back uh, commander at the time, and uh, we were having a beer, and he said, Well, that guy you like it over there, so I said, Top Gun. I said, Oh man, this is shit, huh? And this is great, flying in. And this is, uh, I said, But it's going to come to an end pretty soon because the bureau said they're going to send me to PG school. He said, You want to go to PG school? I said, yeah, No, not really. What about telling me there's a master's degree, huh? And he said, uh, so you like it over there in Top Gun? You like to be there for a full tour? I said, yeah, but Kevin, I said, um, I don't have much choice. I said, I don't like my own orders. He said, well, okay, we'll see about that. So about a week or so later, Captain Lamro said, uh, uh, 
check the message board. He said, uh, he said uh, and I got orders to be XO at Top Gun. So uh, what's that old saying about the right place at the right time and who you know and who you don't know and all that stuff. So Scotty Navarro was uh, instrumental in getting me out of PT school. Did Top Gun, I spent two and a half years there. Went on F-14s and the rest of history as it says. But anyway, that's uh, that's our story. Uh, I always like, again, I, I, I don't, I'm not uncomfortable with that hero, hero stuff, but I'm a product of naval aviation training. Everything I accomplished, the bigs, being able to survive the big experience and, and all that stuff is a product of my military training and Navy training. And so that's why I attribute that to you. Uh, there was nothing in my DNA or anything when I walked out of the corner field of Illinois and in the Navy that said I was going to do all that stuff. I'm, I'm very pleased and proud of my performance. But I learned a lot there. And I think you and a lot of people that I'm often come up and say, oh my God, I could never have done that. Again. Every one of you out there, if you found yourself, you're part of some naval aviation training too. Every one of you out there could do that if you had to. That's something I found out is it's amazing what you can do when you really don't have any other choice but to do it. And so that's uh, that's just something that I, I take uh, take away from it. I learned a lot about myself. About uh, I found out my uh, endurance for pain, uh, what its level was, and what the breaking point was. And uh, so a lot of introspection that I went through, and talking to my other POWs too. All of us will tell you that we came back a little bit changed. I'm still as goofy as ever, and uh, I still like to tell the corny jokes. And uh, you know, and she's uh, 58 years this past June. She's put up with me now, and uh, she's I've got a petition into. Just about got him where I want him. Just about, not about to start over. I got a petition into the Vatican about perhaps uh, canonizing her, but I haven't heard back on that yet. But, uh, the other side of it is the spouse is also. I took a marriage vow, and so I did what I thought Jack would call me to do. And that's pretty much what you all would have done, too. That's our story. But as I said, starting out here, it's not just the person who is serving, but the whole family serves while you're serving. And it affects the whole family just like that. 